Hey, it's Gary. Welcome back to Gundog. We're here with another episode. This is episode six of nine in total. So structurally, we're kind of coming into the third act now. Things are starting to heat up, starting to accelerate more and more action as we kind of move towards the climax of the story. Um, if you've been following along, you'll probably remember where we left things uh, last week. Dakota and Runyon had discovered the big uh, secret underground military installation where the gun dog was waiting for them, along with Rosie, uh, Dakota's mother, who's been dead technically for 20 years, but has been has been kept alive in the form of a uh, kind of a heuristic, artificially intelligent uh, holographic AI program. And now she is um, uh, in episode uh, episode five. She helped Dakota and Runyon uh, train to operate the gun dog with uh, Dakota as the gunner and Runyon as the pilot. They got the gun dog ready to go. They took it out into the world and kind of had their first little skirmish, first successful test of the Liberator's uh, weapon systems against the mech. But that was all the appetizer for the main course, the actual mission, uh, which is uh, the subject of episode six. I hope you enjoy it. This one's called Bismarck. Gundog by Gary Witta. Chapter 20 they spent the next hour cleaning up the mess they had made. Runyon piloted the Liberator around the field of battle, while Rosie operated its materials reclaimer system. Essentially, an array of electromagnetic vents on the giant walker's underside that scanned and then selectively vacuumed up anything that could be repurposed. In this instance, that meant spent shell casings and the wreckage of the smashed mech drones. Everything from twisted pieces of their metal armor to their internal electronic components and power cells. Once inside the reclaimer system, they were automatically separated and sent to the particle reprocessor, which distilled everything down to its base particulate matter, to be reconstituted into anything the Liberator might need to repair and rearm itself. By the time the processing was done, the minor damage to the gundog's left leg had been completely repaired, and reconstituted 75 caliber chain gun shells replaced what had been used in the battle. The remainder of the salvage was kept in the reprocessor's reserve well for future needs. Not bad for our first real scrap, said Rosie when they were done, and she meant it. Considering how little training she'd been able to provide them, things could have gone far worse. Both you kids did good, but you're going to have to keep doing better. An observer and a handful of scuttlers is nothing compared to what we'll face when we get to Bismarck. We're not going to Bismarck right away, said Dakota. There's somewhere else we need to stop first. Oh, said Rosie. This was the first she'd heard of it. I'm putting in the coordinates now. Dakota punched them into the control console before her. It's not far out of our way. Rosie studied the coordinates being fed to her. There's nothing there, she said. Just an abandoned town. There is something there said Dakota, and I need to see it for myself. Rosie detected several of Dakota's biosigns fluctuating. Dakota? Falk is dead. You do know that. I know, said Dakota. I also know he deserves a proper burial. I owe him at least that much. We all do. None of us would be here without him. This is not a good idea, Rosie cautioned. We can either do this, or we can turn around and go back to the hangar, said Dakota. Mom, don't fight me on this. Rosie could tell by the steel in her daughter's voice that there would be no arguing with her. Runyon, she said. Proceed to those coordinates. She sent the new navigation data to his cockpit display, and without a word he sent the Liberator on its way again, an iron colossus taking great strides across the plain. They traveled the rest of the day without incident. The Liberator's stealth array worked just as advertised, allowing them to move freely across the terrain without fear of being spotted by a mech satellite or the long-range sensors of patrolling drones. 
Twice they detected surveyors on the outer edge of their own sensors. And on each occasion, Dakota wanted to reroute and engage them, arguing that it would be best to clear the area before proceeding. But her mother overruled her. With the initial live weapons test completed successfully, Rosie said, there was no further need to go looking for trouble. They arrived at the small town just before sundown. And there it was. The blackened ruins of a house burned down to its frame. Dakota directed Runyon to stop beside it. Then she removed her helmet, popped the cockpit canopy, and clambered down the side of the Liberator via its external rungs and footholds. Runyon opted to remain in the pilot's chair, claiming the Liberator might suddenly need to move in a hurry, though Dakota suspected he had his own reasons for hanging back. The topic of Falk always seemed to make him uncomfortable. Dakota dropped the last several feet to the ground. A compartment set into the Liberator's right foot held emergency supplies. First aid, sidearms and ammunition, survival gear. She took an entrenching tool from the kit and looked around. This place looked different by daylight. When she had been here before, there had only been the pallid light of the moon and the fierce glow of the house as it burned. She looked to the tree at the edge of the house's front yard, the place where she had left Falk to die. Grimly, she headed toward it, knowing she'd find his body on the far side. She dreaded the thought of seeing him as he by now surely was, bloated and pecked at by birds after days of rotting in the sun. But she girded herself and continued on, understanding at last why people were due respect even in death. And if anyone had earned that respect, it was Falk. She arrived at the far side of the tree and froze, not understanding what she now saw. He's not here, she said. His blood was there. The trail he had left from the house as Dakota had dragged him out of there, the pool of it beneath the tree where he'd lain dying. It was dried and black now, matting the grass. But of Falk himself, there was no sign. I hate to say it, said Rosie in her ear, but it's not uncommon for a mech beam to completely vaporize a person. At close range, against a soft target, there's not much left. I know, said Dakota. I've seen that. But there'd be something. Scorch marks, there's nothing. It's like he just vanished. She turned, surveying her surroundings once more. When she left him, he'd been unconscious. Was it possible he'd somehow roused and crawled into hiding somewhere? But even if he had, surely the mech that had been closing on their position would have detected him, captured him, recycled him. Still, she looked around the entire yard, the ruins of the house, he was nowhere. This doesn't make any sense, she said. How can he be gone? Whatever happened, we can't stay here, said Rosie. I'm sorry about your friend. He was my friend's son, too. But there's nothing we can do now. And we still have the mission. Get back up here, and let's go back to work. I know you're frustrated, but trust me, there's going to be no shortage of mech to take that out on before we're done. Dakota paced uselessly, beside herself. This was a puzzle that plagued her for reasons that were much deeper than mere curiosity. Dakota, came Rosie's voice again. You need to... Dakota pulled out her earpiece, cutting her off. After a few moments, she heard noise from above and looked up to see Runyon clambering down the side of the gundog. Rosie didn't give up easily. Poor Runyon was going to be used as a go-between. As he approached, Dakota raised a hand to keep him at a distance. Don't, she said. I just need another minute. Runyon stood and waited. He, at least, knew better than to push. Dakota looked up at the sky, as though the answer might somehow be up there but saw only slowly rolling clouds. Think. Think. What could have happened? 
The mech didn't leave him here to die, she said, thinking aloud. They didn't vaporize him. That can only mean they took him. They took him somewhere to interrogate him, find out what he knew, where he was headed. He has the map on his arm. If they decode it, Runyon gestured to his earpiece. Dak, she really wants to talk to you. Reluctantly, Dakota put her own earpiece back in. Dakota, said Rosie. What the mech get from him doesn't matter now. The hangar's empty, and even if they find it, I left a little surprise there for them. Now please, I can't protect you when you're outside. Please, get back up and- No! cried Dakota. Don't you see what this means? If the mech took him alive, that means he's still alive. They have him somewhere right now. They'll have patched him up, fixed him, kept him alive to answer questions. Suddenly, she was filled with hope again. Remote, to be sure. But it burned like a flame inside of her. He was alive. The mech had him somewhere. And she had the means to get him back. We have to find him, she said. Rosie's voice was firm. That's not the mission, Dakota. Why not? Think. Where would they have taken him? Badly injured, in need of serious medical care. A high-value prisoner. Where? Bismarck, right? And that's where we're going already, isn't it? If you think I'm going all that way, to where they're holding him, and leaving without him... An alarm sounded up in the empty cockpit. We've got an incoming hostile, said Rosie. Bearing 350-1500 meters. Both of you, get up here, now! 1400 in closing. Dakota and Runyon scrambled back up the Liberator's rungs and reseated themselves in the cockpit. The canopy dome closed over them as Dakota put on her helmet and checked her readouts. It's a single rover, she said. Nothing to worry about. She began powering up her twin chain guns, more eager than ever right now to reduce a mech, any mech, to a smoldering pile of scrap metal. Let's leave it, said Rosie. It's no threat to us, but I don't want it transmitting our location if it sees us. Runyon, get us out of here. Not yet, said Dakota. I want this one. She didn't care if this mech was a threat or not. Didn't care that it wasn't the one that had taken Fox life. All she wanted right now was to kill a mech, any mech. To kill every single one of them in Fox's name, starting right here and now. Twenty seconds to firing range, Rosie sighed. If you have to kill it, at least kill it at long range. Take it now with the M99, then let's get the hell out of here. At Rosie's recommendation, the fire control panel for the Liberator's heavy tactical rifle started flashing. The long gun was capable of scoping in and killing a mech drone from 5,000 meters out, before it even knew what had hit it, or from where. But Dakota ignored it. Stayed with the chain guns. She wanted to watch this one die up close. Uh, Dak? said Runyon. Maybe listen to her? But Dakota wasn't listening to either of them. She was focused only on the rover, coming now into visual range. She raised her arms, and so did the Liberator, moving the chain guns into firing position. The twin holographic crosshairs projected onto Dakota's helmet visor, locked onto the target with an affirmative tone. It was within firing range now, but Dakota let it get closer. Closer still. She wanted it close enough that she could imagine smashing it with her bare hands. Dakota, take it now, Rosie barked. That's an order, or I'll transfer fire control to Runyon and have him do it, now. The rover was about a hundred meters out when Dakota finally pulled the triggers and reduced it to scrap. She let go and slumped back, gazing numbly at the smoking crater in the earth, satisfied, but not nearly enough. Runyon, said Rosie, let's get moving. Runyon engaged the Liberator's drive systems and had just started moving them away from the house when a shrill alarm sounded in the cockpit. Shit, said Rosie. 
I knew it. Knew what? Runyon asked. What is this? Big energy signature. I can't get a bearing on it, but it's mech. Something's targeting us. That rover called in our position. I told you not to let it get too close. Dakota scanned her threat display for any sign of whatever might be targeting them. But there was nothing. And then, directly above them, the clouds darkened and crackled and roiled, as though a thunderstorm had appeared from nowhere on this previously bright sunny day. Runyon! shouted Rosie with sudden urgency. Hard left! Runyon jerked the controls over, and the Liberator vaulted sideways, just as a searing column of light broke through the clouds and plowed into the earth twenty meters away, shaking the ground with such force that Runyon struggled to keep the gun dog upright. Dakota had to shield her eyes from the blinding light of the beam, and when at last it dissipated, it left behind a burning crater as wide as it was deep, belching a thick column of black smoke. What the hell was that? Dakota cried out over the blaring cockpit alarms. That's why I couldn't get a bearing, said Rosie. It's directly above us. What? said Dakota. What's directly above us? Some kind of suborbital energy cannon. That's a new one. One direct hit from a beam with that kind of power and we're dead. I've got sensors on it now. About half a click overhead. It's angling and powering up for another shot. Our scrambler's making it hard for it to get a lock on us, but sooner or later, it's gonna get lucky. What do you want me to do? asked Runyon. For a moment, Rosie seemed to have no answer. Rosie? said Runyon. Should we run? Stand by. Another silence from Rosie. All too long. Mom? said Dakota. Finally, Rosie responded. Okay. Here's what we're gonna do. We are gonna let that thing keep shooting at us. We're gonna do what? Dakota and Runyon said in unison. When that thing fires, it generates an energy signature I can use to dial in on its position. If I can get a lock on it, we can send up a directed EM pulse and fry its systems. Runyon, I just need you to dodge a few more shots. Starting right now. Move! Where? Runyon shouted. Anywhere but here! Runyon sent the Liberator lurching forward in a great bound, and not a moment too soon. Another white-hot beam of light pierced the clouds and blasted the earth beneath it. The shockwave from the impact was almost enough to send the gun dog toppling forward, and Runyon cursed as he fought to keep them upright. Shit! That one almost got us! He kept them moving now, as fast as the Great Colossus would go. Practically a gallop. That's good, said Rosie. Keep going, as fast as you can, and let that thing up there try to lead us. Next shot's gonna be dead ahead of us. When I say, break hard. All Dakota could do was sit and watch, the Liberator's weapon control arms hanging limply before her, useless. For the first time since she'd settled into this seat, she felt powerless again. It was all up to Runyon now, a kid who just a few weeks ago she wouldn't have trusted to wipe his own nose. It's powering up again, said Rosie. Any second. Now! Runyon hit the brakes hard, and the Liberator came to a grinding halt its great feet carving deep furrows into the earth. Cover your eyes, Rosie warned, and Dakota threw up her hands to shield them as the searing beam came down once more with a deafening foom, impacting directly ahead of them and showering them with great clumps of burning earth. The Liberator was rocked yet again, and this time, Dakota felt a wave of sweltering heat wash over her, even through the cockpit's shielding. It's getting closer every time, she shouted. So am I, said Rosie grimly. One more shot, and I'll have it locked. I don't know if we can survive one more shot, grumbled Runyon. Less talking, more moving, said Rosie. It's already powering up again. Let's not give it a sitting target. Move! Runyon set the Liberator in motion again, 
this time moving in an erratic zigzag pattern. All Dakota could do was monitor the navigational grid on her multifunction display. And she didn't like what she saw. Uh, is that a ravine up ahead? She said. It was at least twenty meters wide, and God only knew how deep. It extended to the horizon in both directions, so there was no way around it. And they were headed straight for it, coming up fast. Don't stop, Rosie ordered. The mech targeting is tracking right behind us this time. It thinks we're going to try to break on it again. What the hell do we do then? Runyon asked. Keep going, full speed, and over the ravine, said Rosie. You want me to do what? Runyon said. Uh, we never did anything like this in the simulator, added Dakota, sharing his apprehension. This baby's got a few extra tricks in her that the sim model didn't said Rosie. Just go full throttle at that ravine, and when I say, push up hard with both feet. Trust me, we can make it across. Are you trying to tell us this thing can fly? Dakota asked. No, said Rosie, but it sure as hell can jump. Runyon, now! They were just a few paces from the yawning chasm that snaked across the plain. Dakota gripped her seat hard fingernails digging deep into the leather as the Liberator planted its feet at the ravine's edge and took a giant leap forward, vaulting into the air, the ground suddenly dropping away beneath them as they sailed over the deep fissure that carved the landscape into two. At virtually the same moment, the mech beam came down right behind them, exploding the edge of the ravine and sparking a rock slide that went crashing down into the winding river far below. Time seemed to stand still, as the Liberator soared, untethered, through the air, and crashed down again on the far side of the chasm, just a few meters clear of the precipitous drop behind them. They stumbled uncontrollably. Runyon and the machine's automatic stabilizers working together, frantically, to keep the Colossus from toppling over face first. Finally, with one last lurch, the Liberator came to a sliding halt, and Dakota was thrown forward hard in her chair, held in place only by her safety harness. All was still. That's it. I've got a lock, said Rosie. Dakota, fire the EM now. Dakota slammed her palm down on the button flashing on her weapons display. Nothing happened. Dakota leaned forward craning her neck upward to see, but through the cockpit dome above, there was nothing visible but cloud and sky. Mom? Direct hit, Rosie cried. The EM pulse just fried that son of a bitch good. Every system's down. We got it. Dakota turned her head to look back at Runyon. Good job, she said. He grinned. Yeah, not bad, huh? Uh, wait. Little problem, said Rosie. Runyon, get us moving again. Now. Runyon quickly grabbed the controls. What's wrong? That thing was right above us when I fried it, and now it's on its way down. Fast. Directly above us? Dakota asked. You catch on fast. Runyon, why are we not moving? Drive system cut out, he said. Restarting now. Runyon was running hurriedly through the engine restart sequence, flipping switches and toggles as fast as he could to bring full power back to the Liberator. Finally, the main drive came to life, and they were moving again, quicker and quicker with each step, speeding to a full run. Dakota looked in her rear display to see the mech weapon, a massive cylindrical satellite plummet from the clouds above, and slam into the ground with an almighty crash, right where the Liberator had been standing just moments ago. It's down, said Rosie, with an air of triumph and relief. Runyon brought the Liberator to a halt, then swung it around. The mech cannon that had fallen from the sky was now a burning hunk of twisted and broken metal, jutting out of the earth like an ancient tombstone. I'm still getting a weak signal from it, said Rosie. 
could still be transmitting our position. Dakota. Dakota leaned forward in her chair and took hold of the control arms with relish. Glad to finally have something to do, and to destroy another mech, even if the job was mostly done already. She locked on to the wreckage and opened fire. She watched with satisfaction as it exploded in a raging fireball, then let up on the triggers and slumped back into her seat. Time to go, said Runyon. Nothing else on sensors, so we've got a little time, said Rosie. Let's clean up first. All that wreckage is good fodder for the reprocessor. And hey, great job. Both of you. As Runyon piloted the Liberator around the debris field, collecting every scrap and component, Dakota pulled a ration bar from a compartment beneath her seat. It was stale and tough to chew, but she wolfed it down hungrily. It tasted like victory. Command Unit Report, Unit Rank, War Commander, First Class, Designation, Mech, 39487651287423, File, 11861543, MKST, 3485.494, Upon completing analysis of neurogenic imaging scan of illustration formally imprinted on right arm of subject number 8147675, Samuel Bregman, this unit extrapolates and acquires suspected destination of escape subjects number 8147676, Dakota Bregman, and Number 3990983, Stephen Falk. Having received an assumed command of requested mobile strike force classification A, this unit proceeds to target destination located at coordinates 43.8719 by 103.4575. This unit conducts search of target coordinates and uncovers evidence of subterranean military complex. Security procedures appear minimal. This unit leads strike force inside complex. Strike team conducts thorough search and multi-scans. Complex appears abandoned. Evidence of recent human habitation. Purpose of complex unknown. Likely purpose, heavy military vehicle construction and maintenance. Main power, offline. Computer systems, online. Running on backup power. All attempts to access data archives interdicted by advanced security protocols administered by Central Computer. Repeated attempts to access data archives activates artificially intelligent subroutine, identifying itself as Rosie's Welcome Mat. Record of interface follows. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. You didn't say the magic word. Identify. I'm not going to help you, mech motherfucker. State the purpose of this installation. Okay. Are you deaf, or are you just stupid? Deaf implies sensory impairment. Stupid implies insufficient intelligence. Neither applies to this unit. Okay. So what are you doing here, stupid? Searching for human escape subjects, multi-scan evidence detects genetic evidence of their recent habitation here. You will comply with all requests for information. Yeah, I'm going to go with no on that one. Non-cooperation will result in removal of your central processing and memory units for disassembly and data extraction at Mech Central Plexus. You mean Bismarck? Mech Central Plexus. You ever wonder why it was so easy for you to bypass my external security and make it down here? I wanted you here, you stupid metal fuck. Clarify. Right now, you're standing on about half a ton of compressed explosive compound rigged to bring this whole mountain down on top of you. I've got you right where I wanted you. 
Thanks for playing, asshole. Commander, to all strike team units, evacuate installation immediately. Too late, motherfucker. The Bregman family and the entire human race sends its regards. In case you were wondering, the magic word is... Boom. These units sustain heavy damage. It explode for motor function. Solution to return to surface installation and surround mountain. It stri oh, it's strike team lost. This unit requires three, 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 this is this is this is stand by. This unit requests immediate maintenance support and replacement strike team to continue pursuit of escape subjects. Number A one four seven six seven six Bregman and number not three 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 nine nine zero nine eight three Fork. Stand, 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 stand by. Stand by. Chapter 21 The gundog hangar's been destroyed. Rosie's voice stirred Dakota and Runyon as they dozed in their cockpit seats, catching some much-needed sleep. The Liberator was crouched within a dense forest whose treetop canopy at least kept it partially concealed. Even with all its stealth systems to throw off mech sensors, there was always the chance of being spotted visually. So Rosie had recommended employing some old-school camouflage while Dakota and Runyon got their first night of sleep in the field. I should say, I destroyed the gundog hangar, Rosie continued. Most of it, at least. The mech found it. They must have finally gotten its location from Sam. He held out longer than most would have. There was a sadness in Rosie's voice, a tone that matched Dakota's thoughts. For all the good that she had accomplished since escaping the township, for all the satisfaction she felt with every smashed mech, she had still left her brother behind, to be tortured by his captors. W what do you mean you destroyed it? Runyon asked. When we built the hangar during the war... We wired it to blow in the event of a mech infiltration, to prevent them from acquiring any of our data or tech, said Rosie. I left a rudimentary AI program behind when we moved out, and set it to monitor the security systems and blow the base if the mech got inside. I would expect their entire search team was destroyed when the mountain went up. Should slow them down a bit anyway, buy us a little time. Score another one for the home team. After that, Rosie fell silent, and Dakota was surrounded only by the chirping of insects and the rustling of nocturnal animals through the window she had cracked open in the cockpit dome to get some fresh air. This forest was alive with creatures that knew nothing, cared nothing, about the war that had displaced humankind from its role as the planet's dominant species. Dakota lay back in her seat and listened to their symphony, gazing out at the whispering treetops and blanket of stars above little points of light that, as Sam had taught her, were actually great balls of burning gas, far, far larger than this entire planet. She wondered how many of those distant stars might be orbited by planets like this one, worlds alive with other civilizations, other cultures. What might they be like? More conquerors like the Mech, that ventured out across the stars only to usurp and enslave other worlds? No she told herself. Though the mech were the only alien species Dakota knew of, she refused to believe that they could be the norm. The existence of human life here on Earth, and the values she was raised to believe defined it, compassion, 
mercy, kindness, selflessness, were surely proof that those things existed out there too, in the vast darkness of space. The alternative was unthinkable. An entire universe filled with nothing but bullies would be the most alien concept of all. And that was all the mech really were. Bullies. Sam had explained that to her many times. Bullies might be bigger and stronger than you were, but more than anything, they were cowards. Afraid. That was why they only sought out the smaller and weaker, never those their own size and strength. And the one thing a bully feared most was that his prey however small or weak, might one day find the courage to hit back. We won't run from them forever, Sam had told Dakota more than once during their years on the run. One day, we'll stand up to them. We'll fight back. She wished Sam could see her now, could see how she, with their mother's help, had made that promise a reality. She hoped he was still alive so that she might have the chance to show him herself. And she hoped, she hoped that he could forgive her. Because she was free. And he was still captive. He'd spent years keeping her safe from the mech, sacrificing more and more of himself with each passing year. And how had she repaid him? By abandoning him to run away with a man she hardly knew, based on little more than a vague, fantastical promise? She'd made the choice to escape with Falk, even as she knew that Sam would be left behind to suffer at the hands of the mech because of what she had done. You shouldn't blame yourself. She turned around in her seat. Runyon was looking at her from the pilot's chair above and behind hers. What are you talking about? She said. He found something else to look at, staring out beyond the cockpit glass at the night sky beyond. Whichever one it is you're thinking about right now, he said. Sam or Falk, neither of them were your fault. You did the right thing, what you had to do. How can you know that, she said, glaring up at him. The subject made her uncomfortable enough in her own head. It was multiples worse to have it spoken aloud by someone she still barely knew. You weren't there. No, he said, his eyes finding her again. But I know you well enough by now that I know you did everything you could for both of them. Putting whatever happened to them on yourself is only going to eat you up inside. It's no good. She knew that what he was saying was right. But still, her first instinct was to reject it. You don't know me. We've only been together for two weeks. It's nothing. It's not nothing to me, said Runyon. And it's more than two weeks. I watched you for a long time at the township. How you always looked out for your brother. Kept him safe. The mech would have recycled him if not for you. Even what you're doing now, everything you're doing now. You're doing it for Sam. You're not doing any of this for yourself, but for him. If I'm wrong, tell me. She found herself looking at him differently. This wasn't the same Runyon she thought she knew. Not the callow boy she'd occasionally catch watching her from afar back at the township. Nor the same person who'd shown up at the gundog hangar, half dead from malnutrition and exposure. He was braver. Wiser. Stronger than she'd given him credit for. Even if being around her still made him seem strangely nervous. And she was forced to admit to herself at least, that he was right about her. This had all been for Sam. He had risked so much, his very life, so many times to keep her free from the mech, and her desire to escape and find whatever Falk promised they would find had been driven by her desire to at last return the favor, not merely to keep him alive day by day in the township, which she considered the very least she could do for him, but to set him free. She looked back to the stars, saw a single point of light streaking across the ink-black sky in an elegant arc. A shooting star, or something else. 
it gave her cause to worry and wonder. Had word of their fledgling rebellion already made its way back to the mech homeworld? Might reinforcements already be on their way here to snuff it out? She knew that the mech lived some unfathomably vast distance away, but had no idea how quickly their ships allowed them to traverse that distance. So far, things have been relatively easy. How long would that last? Both of you, get some sleep, Rosie chimed in. Big day tomorrow. Dakota shifted onto her side, trying to find a comfortable position in a chair that wasn't designed to be slept in. She pulled a blanket up over her, more for comfort than for warmth. When she was little, running from the mech with Sam, she often pulled whatever blanket they had over her head at night, in the childish belief that it would keep her safe from the metal monsters that prowled the world. Now it kept her safe, equally childishly, from Runyon's annoyingly incisive probing into her psyche. What's tomorrow? asked Runyon as he too settled in for the night. Tomorrow, said Rosie, is when the real work starts. Chapter 22 They set out before dawn, planning to make as much of the day as possible. For the entirety of their journey, they encountered not a single mech. Rosie used the Liberator's sensors to detect any patrolling units at long range, and plotted course corrections to give them a wide berth. It frustrated Dakota some, as she was itching for another fight. Still trigger-happy, as Rosie put it. But it was important to remain undetected as they approached Bismarck. If the mech extrapolated their heading and destination from any sightings, their task when they arrived would be all the more difficult. And it was going to be difficult enough already. With Runyon driving and Rosie navigating, there was little for Dakota to do in her gunnery chair but take in the sights. It was a strange experience. Traveling by daylight was going to take some getting used to. For her whole life on the run, she'd moved by cover of night and slept by day. So the world at large had always been a landscape cast only in the pale monochrome of moonlight. Now, encased within an armored shell and protected by sensor-defying stealth technology, she was able to stride across country in broad daylight and see the wide world for what it was. And what it was, was majestic. Rolling green mountains and lush forests, and sun-glistened rivers. A natural world seemingly untouched by the horrors of the war that had decimated human civilization. The elevated view from the Liberator's cockpit dome afforded Dakota a clear view of everything. And it took her breath away. But nothing struck her so deeply as the beautiful emptiness and quiet of it all. Had it always been this way, she wondered, even before the mech arrived? Once, Sam had told her, there were billions of people in the world. That meant thousands of millions, a number incomprehensible to her. How many of those still remained, after the carnage of the war, and two subsequent decades of selective herd culling by the mech? Humans had already been few and far between in the days before she entered the township. Surely now there were fewer still. Occasionally they passed near the broken ruins of a highway, strewn with burned and rusted vehicles, or saw on the horizon the shattered skyline of a long-emptied human city. These were the only indications of how populous the world had once been. Now they were just sprawling, crumbling gravesites. Dakota always looked away, focusing on something else, until these haunted places were out of sight behind her. The Liberator was moving at its maximum speed, galloping across the landscape far faster than its size and weight would suggest possible. The Gundog was a strange beast, a walking contradiction, a leviathan bulk with a graceful elegance to its movement. It was exhilarating to be moving so quickly, from such a position of power, and despite Runyon's grumbling about the seat cushions, Dakota found the ride surprisingly comfortable. As long as it didn't make any sudden lurching movements, the Liberator's gyroscopic suspension kept the cockpit stable even as it took great leaping strides across the land. Dakota's thoughts drifted to the other gundogs, the earlier models, 
the ones that were said to have fought in the final battle. Back in the township, at story time, some had said those gundogs fought to the very last. Others, that their pilots had panicked in the face of an overwhelming enemy and fled, leaving the last city defenseless. Dakota had always stood up against those who had called her mother, and the others at that last stand, cowards. But she couldn't deny that all along, she had nursed her own private doubts. Now, she realized, she at last had the chance to know the truth. Mom? What is it? came the voice of Rosie in her earpiece. What happened at Bismarck? In the last battle? There was a pause. Why do you ask? Some people say the gundogs didn't fight to the end. That they turned and ran. Abandoned the city to the mech. There was a crackle in Dakota's headset as though Rosie's consternation was so great it registered as static feedback. Who says that? Dakota couldn't help but notice the sudden change in Rosie's voice. The affront. And now it was her turn to pause, and she wondered whether to press the matter. Dakota, I asked you a question. Who says that? Some of the people in the township, said Runyon, saving Dakota. When they tell the story, there's never just one version. Well, there is just one version, said Rosie, her indignation evident. The truth. I was there. I know. Your brother and you were both inside that city. And if you think for one second that I, that any of us would have abandoned you, well, I don't even know what to say to you. Did you really believe that, even for a moment? Dakota didn't know what to say, either. Her whole life she had believed that the mech had come in peace, only to be betrayed by a reckless and greedy human race, and her mother had revealed that to be a lie. Who knew how firm the foundation was for any of her other beliefs? All she knew was what she desperately wanted to believe. So you didn't run away, she said. Hell no, said Rosie. And when we get to Bismarck, I'll prove it to you. A warbling alert sounded on Runyon's cockpit display. What's that? asked Dakota. Bismarck, said Runyon. They took up position behind a hill about a mile outside the city's perimeter. It was by now getting dark which was good. What would come next would be easier by cover of night. Runyon set the Liberator into its crouch position, giving it a lower profile. Concealed by its stealth systems, the gundog was all but invisible to mech sensors. The only way for them to be discovered would be if a drone or fast mover spotted them visually, and their own sensors showed that the only mech units were a safe distance away, patrolling the city's perimeter. As Rosie kept an eye out for danger, Dakota and Runyon climbed down to the ground to stretch their arms and legs. Sitting in the cockpit for hours on end had left their joints aching and backsides numb. When they had worked out the kinks, they crawled up the hillside's shallow incline to observe what lay beyond. They used binoculars for a closer, more detailed view, and what they saw was breathtaking, but in a way that was altogether different from the natural wonders Dakota had observed on their journey here. The sprawling outskirts of the city of Bismarck looked much like the other abandoned population centers they'd encountered. Desolate, crumbling ruins of a place once bustling with human life. But at its center was now a mech monstrosity, a cluster of gargantuan pyramids, imposing in their towering height and perfect in their geometric precision, surrounded by a featureless perimeter wall. The very sight of it made Dakota feel sick. There it is, said Rosie in their earpieces. Mech Central. Runyon swept the area with his binoculars. Not a lot of mech, he observed. I'd have thought this area would be swarming with them. No humans come within miles of this place in twenty years, said Rosie. The mech don't think any of us would dare. 
so they've gotten complacent. We'll use that against them. Do all the mech cities look like this? Dakota asked. I don't know, said Rosie. Never seen any of the others. Though I wouldn't even call this a city. It's more like a fortress. Best we could tell during the war. Mech don't discriminate between civilian and military. It's all the same. A fortress, Runyon said, lowering his binoculars. That doesn't make me feel much better about what we're about to do. Dakota could see that he was nervous. He'd come a long way since she'd first gotten to know him, had proven himself to be far braver than she'd ever expected. But he was also smart enough to be afraid of what lay ahead. She was, too. Dakota, pan right, said Rosie. Something I want you to see. Dakota swept her binoculars to the right, scanning the crumbling buildings that cast long, ghostly shadows as the sun set behind them. Bearing 175, said Rosie. Right in front of that old strip mall. Dakota continued moving her view until the binoculars bearing indicator read 175. She didn't know what a strip mall was, but she found herself looking at a long, squat row of blasted storefronts. She thumbed the wheel on the side of the binoculars to zoom out a little and waited for the glasses to automatically refocus. And there it was. It took her a moment to understand what she was looking at. At first, it looked like a statue standing amidst the rubble of an old parking lot, surrounded by the wrecks of old automobiles. And then, as she zoomed back in for a closer look, she instinctively recognized its shape. It was the burned-out hulk of an M-150 gundog, very similar in outer appearance to the Liberator that had brought her here. Still somehow standing on its scorched and rusted legs, it looked to have taken a hell of a beating. One of its weapon's arms was gone, the cockpit dome was smashed, and the whole thing stood lopsided due to a right knee joint that had buckled, perhaps from damage sustained in battle, but perhaps from age and wear afterward. Dakota lowered her binoculars. Is that... Yes, said Rosie. That was my ride. Don't zoom in too close. What's left of me's probably still in that cockpit. Doubt it's too pretty. Weird, huh? Dakota raised the binoculars and scanned around the position where her mother's gun dog stood. She saw now that the wrecks surrounding the blackened hulk weren't old automobiles but the blasted skeletal remnants of other gundogs. All that remained now of the last human legion, protecting the last human city. They had all fought and fallen here, to the very last, as heroes. All right, said Rosie. Time to get this done. This was the part they'd had the least time to prepare for during their accelerated training schedule and the part that would leave them the most vulnerable. Up until now, they'd been safe in the Liberator, embraced within its state-of-the-art, self-repairing cocoon. But now, they would once again be merely two fragile humans in a world dominated by deadly mech. Rosie would be able to offer them her eyes and ears, and her voice in their earpieces. But while that would be useful, vital even, they would mostly be on their own. If their mission was going to fail, it would most likely fail here. Dakota and Runyon returned to the Liberator, opened a storage compartment on its left foot, and removed belts laden with weapons and specialized gear. As they equipped themselves, Rosie spoke in their earpieces. Okay, listen up. Your target is any data access point you find within the tech operations substructure. Just establish a connection and I'll take it from there. I'll be able to download all the data we need for Phase 2. You just get the hell back out of there once I'm done. Once you're connected, will you be able to find out where they're holding Falk? Dakota asked. That's not why we're here, soldier, Rosie replied in a stern voice. Speak for yourself. Dakota's tone matched her mother's. Will the data hookup give us his location or not? Look. If I can get that information, I will, said Rosie. 
But if I have to spend extra time digging around inside their network to find it, that'll only put you in further danger. I'm not willing to- It's my risk to take. I'm willing to take it, said Dakota. Then she looked at Runyon, realizing she wasn't speaking only for herself here. It was a lot to ask of him. Maybe too much. Me too, he said, his eyes never leaving hers. The lack of hesitation in the way he looked at her said it all. If it was important to her, it was important to him as well. She gave him a nod of appreciation, deeply felt. Of all the things that Runyon had done to earn her trust and admiration, and there had been many, this was the most meaningful. She knew he was interested in her. If she had been too preoccupied to see it before, it had by now become impossible to deny. And yet, here he was, willing to put his life on the line to help reunite her with another man, not him. The nervous, apprehensive boy she had known in the township was a distant memory. The young man before her now was someone else entirely. Someone who'd earned her respect. And more. Rosie sighed. Even if he is somewhere in there, I can't have you running off and turning this mission into some half-assed rescue attempt. This is a smash and grab, in and out fast, and our chances of pulling that off are slim enough already. I won't endanger the mission, Dakota insisted. I just need to know. If he's in there, we'll come back for him after phase two. There was a pause as Rosie considered. Unsure if Dakota was telling her the truth, or just what she wanted to hear. As a soldier, Lieutenant Colonel Rosalind Bregman knew something about combat, that it brought out the true nature of those you served with. And what it was revealing about Dakota was that she had inherited her mother's stubborn streak and her fierce sense of loyalty to those she fought alongside. On this point, there would be no arguing with her. All right she said finally. I've marked the closest data access terminal on the schematic. All you need to do is follow the directions on your visors. Check those now. Dakota and Runyon, still wearing their helmets, flipped down their visors, which augmented their vision with an array of holographic information that included a top-down schematic of the mech base and a directional arrow that ran across the darkened earth before them like a luminous snake, pointing southwest toward the mech perimeter wall. According to the schematic, the wall was three-sided, an elongated triangle like the pyramid structures it surrounded. Dakota wondered what it was about triangular geometry that the mech liked. If it was something fundamental to their mathematical language, maybe even their culture. Not that it mattered. Whatever shape they built their cities, they would all come tumbling down soon enough. Your visor will also give you a threat display, so you're aware of any nearby mech. Rosie continued. The main thing is to stay quiet and stay out of sight. Your suits are equipped with the same stealth tech that keeps the Liberator masked from their sensors, but you can still be seen and heard. Just stay out of their visual and auditory range, and you should be fine. Should be? said Runyon. Best I can tell. The sensors inside the perimeter aren't even set up to detect human targets. Best you can tell? said Runyon. You don't know for sure? There's a lot I don't know about what's waiting for you in there, said Rosie. Hey, I never said this was going to be easy. If you don't think you can do this, now is the time to say so. Runyon and Dakota looked at each other. They could see the fear in each other's eyes. But something else, too. Determination. The only thing they feared more than storming that mech city was the shame they'd have to live with if they were too afraid to try. Why wouldn't the mech in there be set up to scan for humans? Dakota asked. We're their only enemy. No infantry company ever got within shooting distance of a mech base during the war, said Rosie. The gun dogs were the only things that ever got close. So that's what the city sensors were calibrated to detect heavy armor. They didn't think anyone would be dumb enough, I mean, brave enough, to go in there on foot. Great pep talk, 
Runyon grumbled. I feel so much better. You should, said Rosie. They're not looking for anything as small and agile as you. Just stay quiet and keep to the shadows, and you'll be invisible. You do this right, and with a little luck, you'll be in and out with what we need before they even know what happened. With a little luck, Dakota repeated. You'd be amazed how far the human race has made it with just a little luck, said Rosie. When this is all over, I'll tell you all about it. Final weapons check. Let's go. Gundog was created and written by Gary Witta and performed by Shannon Woodward. Special appearance by Troy Baker. Music by Austin Wintery. Edited by David Gatewood. Sound editing by Adam Nickerson. Video editing by Chandana Ekanayaka.